morning. I'm Matt Driscoll, editor of Asian Aviation Magazine and AsianAviation.com. Today we're in conversation with Stefan Fima. Glad I got the pronunciation on that. He's the new vice president, general manager of the newly formed Unmanned Aerial Systems Unit at Honeywell. Stefan, welcome to In Conversation. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, congratulations on the new position. I, I guess it's a new position. It's a new division. Uh, everyone's been talking about UAVs or UASs, uh, pick your acronym uh, that you want. Uh, we have Volocopter that recently did an air taxi trial here in Singapore. Amazon's been talking about delivering packages by drones. Uh, what's the reason Honeywell said, let's get into that business? Well, so um, Honeywell Aerospace has been in this kind of a business for obviously a very, very long time. Uh, it, you know, we were doing it, however, from you know traditional general aviation aircraft, uh, business aircraft, and airliners. So when we saw this this uh, market developing, you know, now about two and a half years ago, when we really first first identified it, you know, we said, well, wait a minute, you know, this is like a whole new sector that's opening up within the field of aviation, and so we want to be there, right? We think this could be disruptive. We think this could be a new segment that's not being done at all today. And we have, you know, we have the, the know-how and the, and the technologies that actually are, are a fit, right? So whether it's propulsion or avionics or whatever, we actually have things that are a fit for, um, for, for this market. And so that, that together with the fact that we really saw it as a big market said, okay, let, this, is, this is what we want to go do. Uh, Mike Matson, the Honeywell president, he said, and, and you just touched on this, that you already contributed technology to the market. Give, give us a, a few specifics on what you're talking about, the, the avionics side, for example. Yeah. So the um, so what he was referring to is that we've actually been involved in this market for over two years now. Um, and so we've been working with a lot of the other innovators uh, in the space, um, mostly the ones that are developing uh, new aerial vehicles. And so one of the things that these vehicles are doing, they're all taking advantage of electric propulsion. And when you do that, you can distribute your propulsion across the vehicle. It doesn't have to be two engines hanging off the wings. And the minute you start doing things like that, especially if they're tilt rotor and these things, um, you, you, this requires things like fly-by-wire technology, right, rather than having mechanical linkages and so on. And Honeywell's been doing fly-by-wire for years. And so we have now for several years been working with some of these companies around how to do compact fly-by-wire systems that are appropriate for these kinds of vehicles. So that would be one example. Yeah, well, I want to talk about that too. I mean, that's interesting. And, and we had the next question about developing new products and, and, and things like that. Um, I just saw a story this morning, actually, that they that the, uh, someone had come up with a better battery than lithium ion. Uh, I mean, that seems to be the, the battery side of things seems to be the real roadblock, not just for aerial vehicles or unmanned systems, but for cars, trucks, whatever. Uh, does Honeywell have any battery research going on? Um, we don't have, I mean, we do some things with batteries and battery management, and, and, and honestly, I'm not particularly familiar with that because we're not really doing that in the UAS space right now. Um, you know, interesting. So, you know, making batteries themselves, for example, is not something that that Honeywell really does. Uh, we do, however, you know, partner with you know whoever else in order to bring together an entire um, electric propulsion system. Um, but I agree with you that you know batteries are. You know, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. That's okay. That's one of the fun things about doing these things via Skype. You get a little cut off once in a while. Yeah. So let me repick up where I was. Sure. Uh, so. Uh, you know, batteries and battery densities, energy densities and, and weight of the batteries, all of that is central to all forms of electric aviation, including, you know, urban air taxis and cargo UAVs and things like that. So, you know, it is something that is central and something that, that obviously, we, you know, we watch. I want to talk to you about geography, actually. Singapore has, we've had some uh, drone trials here. Volocopter did a, uh, uh, did a test flight not too long ago. Uh, in terms of Asia or Europe or the U.S., uh, where do you see unmanned aerial systems developing faster and why? Um, that's, that's sort of a, it's hard to say that one geography is moving faster than the other. Um, interestingly enough, um, 
you know, unlike in traditional aerospace where most manufacturers are, you know, either American or, or European, here we're seeing both manufacturers as well as eventual consumers of the technology in all three of those geographies, right? So there's a, there's, there's a lot of innovation in urban air mobility vehicles coming out of Europe, but there's also, you know, some innovation coming out of Asia as well. I um, mean, Ehang, for example, is one of the two um, big, what we call two-person UAM vehicles that's out there, Volocopter being the other one that you mentioned. And, you know, Ehang is indigenous, you know, born and raised and, and grown up in, in China, right? So, um, and there's nothing else quite like it other than Volocopter. So, you know, there's some unique technologies that are coming out of, of Asia. Um, and in addition to that, there's also an environment uh, the environments are different everywhere, right? And Asia is one of those environments where it's, re it, you know, depending where we're talking about, is relatively permissive to having, you know, new kinds of vehicles, new kinds of operations, wanting to adopt it, uh, whether it's Singapore or China or, or other places. And so just having a permissive environment creates opportunity for innovation and for the thing to take off, right? So I was, I was, see that. Yeah, I was curious about that because, I mean, from a regulatory standpoint, uh, is Asia a little bit more, is it more permissive versus the U.S. in terms of regulatory? We're, we're seeing a bit more, I mean, I use the word permissive. I think what I, you know, I, I mean that, but also there seems to be a bit more of an, you know, in the, in, the, in the positive sense of the word, an aggressive approach towards making this happen, right? Um, I, I think in, in part, let's take the example of China, uh, because of the way the geography is and the, and the terrain, and having so many people across the country and wanting to be able to move parcels and goods more easily and more quickly to different parts of China, that that just naturally engenders, you know, the, the want to use this kind of technology, um, as opposed to, say, the United States that's got a pretty thorough highway network to pretty much any part of the U.S. that you want, right, with, you know, with not so many places that are in mountainous regions and everything else. And so relatively speaking, some geographies just you know, point you in that direction more. And so I think that's part of the reason, but we're, we're definitely seeing that. Let's talk about the drones and the, and the urban taxis and things like that. Do, what do you see has the most potential, first of all, for the market in general, and then specifically for Honeywell as a business? I mean, is it the, the urban taxi that you need to get across Jakarta? If you've ever been to Jakarta, it's, it's, it's an or Manila, uh, it's very hard. Traffic is a nightmare, uh, or is it the the smaller package delivery drones? Which which ones do you think will be uh, come to fruition sooner? Um, so I think. Um, by the way, I think that all segments like this are attractive. They're all very attractive in their own right. Um, you know, when we think about you know urban air mobility and and, and those things, we spend fifty percent of our time thinking about the movement of people and 50% of our time about the movement of parcels and cargo. We, we see them as equal. Um, I think small drone delivery is already demonstrating just by the trials that are going on that that's most likely gonna go first. Um, and uh, you know, there's trials in Asia, or actually in, in, in parts of Asia, it's already like normal. Um, it's, it, it's trials in, in the US and in Europe. And in fact, you know, the, the, you know, at, at, at the time that you and I are talking in the situation with, with COVID happening, it, COVID has actually accelerated the use of drone delivery because what a perfect way to deliver things to people while they stay sheltered at home and without um, putting my own delivery employees at risk, right? So that's actually accelerated those 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 uh, those trials already. So I think drone deliveries, whether it's you know business to consumer drone delivery or it is more of a business to business type of delivery, I think all that, especially with small vehicles, comes first. And I think rapidly on the heels of that is, um, is sort of small to medium sized cargo um, and, and, then, and then humans. And there'll be some you know, exceptions there, but I think it, it happens like that. Small you know, parcels, bigger cargo, and then human beings. Uh, I had a, a really long question written here, but I'm, I'm gonna cut it down a little bit. Uh, the skies are already crowded. I mean, I love, if you watch the movies, Star Wars, or you know, just about any sci-fi movie where you have this 24th century, you have these drones going through you know, crowded lanes. You watch The Fifth Element with Bruce Willis, it's French, good French director. 
Uh, he's driving a taxi, an air taxi, and, and, and all of that. Uh, the skies were already crowded, at least they were before the pandemic hit, but is there room for all the drones that people are predicting and who's gonna manage that airspace? So personally, I believe there's there's gonna be plenty of room. Um, you know, and, and you know, at least in, in colloquial terms, I say, well, look up in the sky, you know, how much of it is crowded at any time, even in, you know, at peak times, right? Um, there, there's, there's definitely plenty of room. Having said that, I know that in major metropolises, you know, there's pretty dense traffic. And it's, you know, I, I remember when I used to live in New York City, you know, there were helicopter corridors along the side of Manhattan Island, and they were, they were, you know, they were crowded, and they had issues with, you know, keeping keeping things separated. So, but I, I think that there's going to be the room, and, and we're doing all the work right now to create that airspace infrastructure that can accommodate it whether it's dedicated corridors or, or things like this or altitude levels that aren't normally being used by aviation anyway. Um, you know, think like 400 feet to 1,000 feet other than helicopters. You don't really have too many planes flying at those altitudes in cities um, or even, even in, in regional areas. So I think there's, there's, there's going to be room to make that work. The other thing is that, you know, what we generally group in as, you know, urban air taxi and, and drones, right, um, a lot of the people out there are targeting a more regional type of, uh, of use case, right? So you want to go from city center to city center, and it's 100 miles away. It's not your normal work commute, but rather than spending two hours in a car or three or four hours in a car, you spend, you know, 30 minutes. And that just sort of falls in line with sort of regular airspace usage, right, which we already have. Right, you, and, and Honeywell actually came out with something the other day. I read read uh, one of the many press releases I read every day of uh, a uh, satellite communication uh, device or system uh, yeah. for the management of drones. Now, is that part of your shop, or is that from another division? Or so that that originated out of Honeywell Connected Enterprise, uh, which is a a sister um, business group uh, within Honeywell that is responsible for everything that is connected. Um, and so th this came from them, but the, the way Honeywell's organized, Honeywell Connected Aerospace, or sorry, Honeywell Connected, and whatever they do that supplies to Honeywell Aerospace, those are kind of meshed, right? Um, so yes, it absolutely falls into our, our scope of the technologies that we leverage in order to provide you know, the right solution for the OEMs that are developing you know, these kinds of vehicles. Now you're obviously developing new products, things like that, you're gonna be selling to, yeah. cu to customers, but are you, Partnering with people like Ehang or Volocopter, I mean, are you you do you have uh, joint R and D projects going on with them? So, um, in the case of Volocopter, we have done some research with them, some research um, programs with them around, you know, how do you land these things? How do you identify landing pads? Things like that. So, we've done some work with them. Um, we have submitted some proposals for some various research activities. Um, I can't quite say who are the partners yet until we win, um, but we have submitted some some uh, some proposals for this kind of research, where we've collected a group of uh, participants that include some of these you know top leading you know vehicle developers you know either startup or established companies, um, as well as you know maybe some universities and things like that to put together groups of, of to do some research to really sort of advance the state of the art here. Um, Beyond that, you know, a lot of these new vehicles, I mean, these are developmental programs, right? And so the, you know, the, the main things that we Honeywell bring to that and where we put our research, you know, efforts into is, you know, we do avionics, right? Everything from the, you know, the software that controls these aircraft to the fly-by-wire system to the actuation to the sensors. We do a lot of that. And these vehicles, especially the more autonomous they get, the more software-driven they become, right? And Honeywell Aerospace has been doing software forever in the form of avionics software and embedded systems. So now we're doing more and more software, whether it's in embedded systems or in other areas, to make these vehicles fly. So we do a lot of work with, these, with our vehicle partners to, to develop that. Propulsion is the other area, right? It's all going electric or hybrid electric. And um, now there, uh, we are partnering with a firm called Denso, which is well known from Asia. Uh, for doing all of the electric motors that go to a lot of the electric uh, cars. And so we've done a partnership with them to take their expertise in high reliability, low cost electric motors, married with 
I mean, all the other components that go into an electric propulsion system for aerospace and our aerospace integration and certification expertise to create a system that is you know, attractive for vehicle developers. Well, I'll talk to you about software development later. I have my own uh, problems with, with uh, software developers from time to time. Um, let me ask you a question. Are you working on products, and I ask this because uh, I also work with a sister publication that covers the defense industry. I do the website for them and things like that. Are your, are your products going to be strictly commercial or will there be some dual use technology as well? Uh, there'll be dual use. There'll be dual use technology for sure. Um, both because, you know, we as Honeywell serve the commercial and the defense uh, customers, and also because the vehicle partners that we work with, they themselves, many of them see themselves serving commercial and defense customers. So, in, in, you know, through both pathways, we'll end up being in both markets. Yeah, the, the drone systems, I mean, the Israelis are very big in drones now, IAI and, and Elbit and, and some of the other companies, so it's very interesting. Yeah. Um, quick question, let's talk about the size of the market. I was reading a nice Reuters story that had a write-up about you. Uh, we're talking $120 billion market by 2030 for air taxis, drone cargo delivery, drone businesses. Uh, yeah. They're saying Reuters reported Honeywell's market opportunity, about 20% of that, uh, yeah. or around there. Is that, do those figures still hold up? Yeah, I mean, those are the numbers that I gave them in that interview. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, the way we look at it, now let me tell you what's in those numbers a little bit. Um, we compute that $120 billion number by saying, okay, how many of these vehicles do we think are gonna be, um, you know, either sold or put into flying use, into operation in the year 2030? And what do we think that, that kind of a vehicle would cost if you were to purchase one, right? And that's how we got to the size of the market is just on what's in the vehicle, it doesn't even include all the other stuff that goes around it. And then we compute, okay, well, so what percentage of that value do we think Honeywell has offerings for, right? Um, and that's the 20% uh, um, number that you that you see there. And, and clearly these are long range forecasts, right? So we, you know, we don't have a, the perfect crystal ball, um, but we do, you know, the best that we can to figure out what we think is going to happen and what we think, you know, the, the, the value that we offer is, is going to be on those vehicles. Well, and that's an opportunity, right? That's the, the size of the opportunity. You know, you know, it would be a great day if we won everything, but, you know, there's always going to be multiple participants in the market. Well, I, I would take 20% of 120 billion, that's for sure. I, I, I wouldn't have any problem with that. Yeah. Um, finally, and, and I want to, I'm kind of a skeptic on unmanned urban taxis, package, you know, getting my pizza delivered by drone, things like that. Just because I've been dealing with computers for a long, long time. I mean, I was using computers when Google came on the scene. Uh, I used to build my own computers when I had my own business back in the States. Uh, you know, using, I, I used to have to install my own network cards and sound cards and, and things like that. So I, I worry about A, the software. Uh, I worry about B, you know, we, the industry, the aviation industry has been talking about setting up planes where you can fly it with one pilot, which I frankly would have a problem with. And now we're talking about jumping in an urban taxi with no pilot uh, and pushing a button and flying across Jakarta or Manila or whatever. Um, and, and again, you know, drone delivery, I live on the fourth floor. I mean, where's the drone going to land? Do I have to go up to the roof and, and get my pizza or get my, uh, get my books from Amazon? Tell me why I'm wrong. Um, the reason you're wrong is because you're already flying in airplanes that are completely software driven anyway, right? Every, every uh, airliner that you fly in is controlled by software in the avionics system that flies that airplane. And that software is already flying that airplane automatically pretty much from takeoff to landing. Right. Already. And, and, we, and, and we call that George, you know, that's... We call it George. We can call it, you know, Cat 3 Auto Land. We can call it the autopilot. We can call it, you know, um, you know, those kinds of things. But at the end of the day, all of those things are software driven systems. Now, the, the kind of software we're talking about here. Um, it is very, very different than the kind of software that you and I, you know, experience every day, you know, day in, day out, right? What we have on our, on our PCs or, you know, something crashes and we reboot it and whatever, 
you know, there's a whole different level of software quality, software reliability, software testing, software assurance, you know, complete system testing and assurance that has to go into these things because these are what we call safety critical systems, right? And so you want them to have a level of reliability that is orders of magnitude higher than what you might need for, you know, your favorite social media application, for example, right? So the reliability and the safety and, and the companies that can do that, I mean, Honeywell is obviously one of those companies that's been doing that for, for years now. Um, that level of quality and reliability is what you want, you know, when you're thinking about the safety of, of people. And so, and that's exactly the kind of, uh, of quality of software that has to go and is going to go into these new types of vehicles. You know, A, you know, people like, you know, companies like Honeywell would do this anyway. And in addition, you've got regulation that's going to make sure that we all do it. I, I have to jump in real quick because you're forcing me to ask this. I mean, it kind of proves my point, though, because we look at what Boeing has had to deal with with the MCAS system and how yes. that plane has been grounded for a long time. This is why you know, it, it, in a perfect world, maybe that software would have been good enough, but obviously it wasn't. So this kind of, I mean, I hate to do this to you, but this kind of, you know, that's why I worry. I, I mean, look, I mean, we're all worried about things like that, right? Um, you know, but, but at the same time, I would say, you know, it unfortunately got caught a little later than we might have wanted, but it got caught, right? It was found out. And now they're taking not one month, but months and months and months to get to resolution, right? Um, this is very much unlike, you know, if you, if you have a, a piece of consumer software where you find a defect and they say, oh yeah, we, we think we'll fix it in the next version. You know, call us back to see about our next release. You, you would never get that in aerospace. In aerospace, it's like ground everybody until we fix it, right? So that's a whole, di that's, that's a whole different level of, of, you know, seriousness to something like that. Um, so, you know, it, it has to be at that level. Um, to your other, um, to your other um, question we're making, like, you know, how's this going to deliver to my door, <laughs> right? If my, I'm my, my, my in a fourth floor apartment, um, you know, a lot of these, especially the small drones, the way they're doing it, they're actually not landing. They're winching it down and then letting the, the um, you know, the package go, you know, in your backyard and then winching back up. They never get close to the, the people. And if you try and yank on the cord, it just, it pulls off. So you, you don't get to pull the drone down from the cord. Um, I've heard stories um, from friends of friends that in China, in, in some places, it is normal for the drone to fly up to the, you know, the 30th floor of the high rise and winch it down to the balcony and you pull in your, your takeout. Um, and so you never need to go outside. So those things are, you know, happening today. So I, I think that uh, I think that's a that's a thing. I, I you know, personally, I, I make jokes with with people inside of Honeywell that the next greatest house addition that people are going to make is a butler. It's a butler that, you know, a, a dumb waiter, sorry, a dumb waiter that from the roof where the, the drone drops off your, uh, your, your takeout, it, it brings it all the way down to your kitchen and you never have to leave your house. You should, you should patent that idea and, and make, a, make a fortune off of it. <laughs> yeah, I guess, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, it's, it's funny to me. I mean, how long do you think it will be before? I mean, I know it's starting now. We have lots of trials going on. Uh, the pandemic, as you mentioned, has accelerated things a little bit. Uh, I mean, is, is Amazon, you know, they've already started their own airline pretty much. They've got Prime Air, which has six or seven planes right now. Mm -hmm. When will they really start rolling this out uh, where, it, where it's a daily reality and not a trial? Yeah, so I don't know because I don't actually know what Amazon is actually planning on doing. Or, or, or you know, I, you know, Pizza uh, Hut. Yeah, or, yeah, I mean, I do know that there are, I mean, we both know, right? I mean, there's trials going on right now, you know, like, you know, I think Walmart's participating in a trial and FedEx is participating in a trial. There's a lot of people and, you know, a lot of people are doing these kinds of things. Um, so, I, I, you know, I think it's soon. I, I couldn't put a, you know, is it this year, next year? I think for sure the next three to five years, this is going to be much more normal. And, and outside of the consumer world, like if you look inside of select enterprise campuses and hospitals and and you know maybe in, in South Africa for you know delivery of medicine, it's already happening now. I mean, yeah. this is not like a future. Yeah, I saw that the other day, and I was thinking about that this morning before I was getting ready to talk to you. You know, when you have, especially with the distances, the lack of infrastructure, uh, the need to get uh, medicines out to a, a, you know a village uh, in the bush uh, that has Ebola or something like that. It, it's and you don't want to risk 
um, sending a team out there or, or a delivery guy uh, into a situation like that. It's the perfect delivery system. Yeah. And even things, I mean, you know, here in the U.S., right, as, 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 as you well know, we have hurricane season that comes through. And if the hurricanes are bad, then all the roads are, you know, you can't travel over the roads right now. You've got disaster relief that has to happen. There's, a, you know, a lot of, you know, bacteria and everything that gets, you know, turned up from all the sewage and everything else. So you have to get medicines in there really fast. And what a, be what a better way than to use drones to deliver medicine, deliver food, you know, aerial observation to find out where people and, and, and even, you know, stranded pets are. There's all sorts of applications where you can't drive in, you can't land at an airport because it doesn't exist anymore. Um, and, and drones are a perfect solution for those kinds of things. Great. Stefan Fima, Vice President for Unmanned Aerial Systems at Honeywell, thanks for joining me in conversation. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.